It's the embed button. Yeah, there it is. Okay, so I can see that Jen and Denna just checked in. Does that mean that they're on? Um, did you are we her? are we live right now, or where are we, Sharif? We are um, broadcasting, and I just posted the link to the page, but I don't know how to tell if people are watching. Okay. I'm waiting. Miriam, do you have any suggestions? You're what? Okay. Miriam says she's doing it right now. Okay. Um, can you po uh, post a note on the, or here, I can post a note on the page, I guess. Just letting people know we're here. Um, Miriam already posted something on the page. Yeah, I see her posting. Okay. Um, Adina, you can start. On. Okay, you can start whenever. Um, can you tell me how many people are on and who's on? Marianne, do you know how many people are on? Uh, it seems like five people are on now. Okay, where can I see that? Because I, I feel the need to interact somehow with the people who <laughs> who are on. And hi, everybody. Salaam alaikum. Thanks for being patient while we work out the kinks here. I yeah, just wanna... you're not, you're not going to be able to, to see it, unfortunately. Okay, We're just so Sharif. To start. All right, Sharif, then I want you to be my eyes and ears. Um, Salaam alaikum, everybody. Sharif Abu Fadl, if you haven't met him already, is. Uh, our community outreach fellow in LA and he's also acting sort of as our technical producer right now so um, I want to let you all know that um, I uh, I can't see who is on um, and uh, your questions will be funneled to me we're experimenting with this format to see how it goes um, and so I uh, really want to encourage you all to uh, post your questions and participate as much as possible if you're having any technical difficulties please also post that um, Sharif and Maryam are uh, Maryam Mohiuddin our communications coordinator um, are, are both on and uh, hopefully should be able to um, help iron things out um, it looks like we have uh, seven people on, and Sharif, if I can ask you to um, uh, IM me the names of the people who are on, um, it'll be helpful to me to know who I'm talking to. Uh, all right. So, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Let's jump. Let's jump in. Um, and I wish I could see your, all, all your faces because uh, you you know that how much that means to me. Eye contact. Um, if you've spent any time with me, um, the reason that we're having this Google Plus is because you've all just been through um, an incredible experience. Um, I or I hope you agree that it was an incredible experience. Many of you have told me, and I've read your reflections um, talking about how transformative your summit experience was um, over the course of the last couple of weeks. And um, uh, nothing makes us happier as an organization because we we value you and your contributions so much and uh, and your ability to amplify your voice and not be a leader of tomorrow but be a leader today and that's why we're doing this Google Plus so quickly after the summit um, we every year after the summits uh, our focus is on um, helping our, our young leaders amplify their voices primarily through op-eds and more recently through blogs um, uh, video blogs and other kinds of formats um, and so today we want to do a deep dive into um, the basics of how to write an op-ed um, and I am going to uh, try to share some resources I'm also using Google Plus for the first time so I'm going to try to do some screen shares if I make any mistakes 
it's a good thing I can't see you. You can laugh at me all you want. Um, but uh, hopefully this will go um, this will go smoothly. Um, and uh, and we'll be sharing some links with you to um, op-eds that have been published by past Media Summit delegates, um, so you can peruse those as we're talking about format and content, um, and also some past op-eds uh, written by MPAC staff and that have been published on different subjects, so you can also see those. Um, and I want to thank uh, Mariam for posing the question about um, who your favorite uh, columnists are? Um, the food. I think the first uh, first way to get inspired to write an op-ed is to just read a, a handful of them because you'll see a rhythm to them um, that will start to emerge once you've read some of them. And hopefully, you all read columnists. I think they're um, among the most well, most commonly shared uh, articles or parts of the of the newspaper or news sites now um, uh, end up on Facebook and Twitter and other places. So this is a great format for you to um, to get involved in. And I know some of you already have. I know, for example, two of our Media Summit delegates, um, Rafine and Sana, um, both had uh, blogs or op-ed pieces published in the last couple of weeks about um, the various sides of being an intern. So um, you're already on your way. So hopefully this will just sharpen up your skills. Um, we're uh, It's now 6.07 by my time. Um, and I will uh, probably go on for about a half an hour. Um, I want you to go ahead and jump in with any questions. Um, and those will appear um, in my chat box and I will try to, to toggle back and forth um, and try to pause here and there, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll play along together through this process. Um, so first things first, how does an op-ed work? Well, what you want to do first is think about the, um, the framing workshop that you all experienced during your summit. The, the main frame of an op-ed and the main point of an op-ed is to make one key point. The thing that you got to remember about an op-ed is it's got to be direct, it's got to be like a bullseye. You only have um, generally 550 to 700 words in an op-ed. Um, and the main purpose of that op-ed is to express your opinion um, in a, in a well-argued way. Um, and so what I want to do is cover um, what makes a good op-ed. Um, uh, what makes a bad op-ed, and then uh, to offer with you a basic outline for um, for for a, or a skeleton for your first op-ed, um, and we'll we'll dive into a couple of examples very quickly. Um, okay, so first and foremost, what makes a, a, for a good op-ed? Well, there's a couple of different qualities. The number one quality is the timeliness of the topic. Right now, what's in the news? Today, it's Egypt. It's all Egypt. If any of you have a personal angle to Egypt, personal experience, family, and some interesting opinions, this would be the perfect time to draft an op-ed um, and send, uh, send that out because your chances of getting published would be a lot higher because it's on a timely subject, and especially in this day and age when you have 24-7 media networks um, that are uh, you know, constantly looking for more content to keep it fresh, your chances of getting published are, pretty, are uh, better than usual. Um, so number one is the timeliness of the topic. Number two is, in your case, um, uh, the inclusion of a local angle to that topic. So if you, if uh, for example, you were going to talk about Egypt or you were going to talk about NSA surveillance or you were going to talk about Guantanamo Bay or you were going to talk about Ramadan or whatever your topic was going to be, um, uh, to be able to somehow personalize it um, is key because that helps you stake out your expert territory. It says to the reader, this is why I should pay attention to this person's opinion. They have some sort of connection to it that makes them, um, if not an academic expert, an, you know, a life expert um, in this area and I should pay attention to what they have to say. Um, that's number two. Number three is um, a good op-eds stake out new ground or clarify the debate. You're adding something new. That doesn't mean that you have to be, you know, earth shattering about your profoundness and it has to be super deep. Um, but uh, you, you're pointing, uh, you can sometimes point attention to, well, here's part of the debate that isn't being discussed. Um, or here, you know, here's something that people aren't paying attention to but could make all the difference. So you're adding an additional, um, an additional dimension to uh, an ongoing debate. That's another factor. That's number three. Number four is somehow it has to be a thought-provoking opinion. Um, and the best way to know whether it's thought-provoking is to bounce it off of people around you. Um, if you, While you're thinking about your op-ed topic, you should be able to um, uh, you know, hold a conversation with a friend about it for at least a minute, um, sort of arguing for, well, here's what my opinion is and here's why that's my opinion. 
um, you know, and, and hold your ground to a certain degree. Um, if that person doesn't, you know, if it doesn't hold, hold their attention, uh, then you might be in trouble. So you want to, you want to think about that aspect. Um, and the number five is, uh, your own personal experience. This is similar to the inclusion of a local angle and often it's the same thing, but, um, your lived experiences, uh, are part of what make you an expert, particularly if you're going to talk about subjects like, um, you know, uh, identity formation among young American Muslims or what it, you know, celebrating 4th of July as a young American Muslim or, um, you know, uh, if, it, if you wanted to talk about Syria, uh, things that are going on in Syria or in Egypt or in other places, to be able to draw upon, you know, your, your family um, experience will definitely help you. So there were five factors there that make for a good op-ed. Um, now let's think about what makes for a bad op-ed. Um, uh, they're very basic and they should be pretty obvious. One is bland ideas. If everybody's already talking about this, you, uh, you just throwing more words at it isn't going to make a whole lot of difference and editors are going to look at it and think, eh, I already read this yesterday or a few days ago. Um, secondly, um, thing, issues that are too obscure. Um, you all went through, I think, the framing um, workshop at the, at the summits and one of the things we talk about is how every idea operates on three levels. Remember the big idea, the issue type, and the specific issue. Well, if you are um, chopping at the weeds um, by uh, going after an issue that is so obscure that there's not a general audience kind of introduction to it, then you need, either need to find a play, like find a place to publish that op-ed that that uh, addresses or caters to that niche, or you need to find a different angle or a different frame to that subject that makes it more um, uh, uh, relatable. Um, so that's another way to make a bad op-ed. Um, another way to make a bad op-ed is to have no real opinion or conclusion. Um, just sharing a lot of facts and, and summarizing what has happened is not an op-ed. You have to you have to state some sort of opinion um, and and have some and ideally have some kind of recommendation or some sort of vision of what you'd like to see happen. Um, that's hopefully at least semi-realistic um, and definitely rooted in principles. Uh, it, not being timely or not being localized, those are other things that make a bad op-ed. Um, you offering your solution to the Israeli-Palestinian crisis, um, you know, and ironing out what the peace deal should look like is not publishable because why should anybody pay attention to your policy recommendations on that subject as opposed to the others who are um, experts in that area. Um, and then lastly is something that uh, you probably might face some challenges with if you try to craft an op-ed around our um, around your experience with the summit, which is that you, bad op-eds, um, make obvious that they were trying to promote an organization or an event, and then they end up reading like a press release. Um, so that's, uh, the, uh, having said that, that's part of what we want to make sure to avoid. Um, uh, this, this Google Plus is to encourage you to write and to write op-eds. Um, secondarily, we're here to encourage you to somehow, you know, make reference to your summit experience in your op-ed um, uh, to demonstrate the access that young American Muslims are getting um, uh, and, and the impact that that has, um, because that's part of how we can contribute to the to the public debate on these issues. So that's what makes good op-eds. That's what makes bad op-eds. Uh, now let's talk about what the particulars of an op-ed are. Um, and if you have any questions, again, I'm looking at leaning into the screen to make sure I'm not missing anything. If you have any questions, please um, jump in anytime, and I'd be happy to stop or even go back and answer them. Um, okay, so the particulars of an op-ed. I already men mentioned the word count. Can you stop and try to remember the word count I mentioned? Uh, 550 to 700 words. Um, it's going to depend to some degree, uh, depending on the outlet that you are pitching to. Um, traditional newspapers stick to this the most. You can find out simply by going to their opinion uh, page um, on their website and it'll generally give you submission guidelines. Um, secondly, um, uh, the word count is very important. If you submit something that's much longer than um, than they're willing to uh, give time to to edit, um, you know, going you know 50 words above or below the margins is okay, but uh, much more than that, and they're just going to give you an automatic no. So you really do need to stick to to that rule um, for the most part. Some places I should mention, like maybe Huffington Post or other kinds of uh, new uh, blog spaces, um, uh, are less restrictive about their word count. So you just again you need to just double check with. The, sort, the media outlet that you're trying to submit to. Um, so that's the length requirement. The um, actual 
structure nut, nuts and bolts of it now. I'm going to do a I'm going to try to do my screen share now. So let's hope together that I do it right. Here we go. Start screen share. Oh no, why is it backwards? Oh wait, there we go. Okay, so you should now be able to see um Sharif confirmed for me that you can see it. You should now be able to see my uh, basic op-ed outline. Um, this is uh, this is oversimplifying, but this is a, this is a basic formula for how to write an op-ed. Because people will say, "How do I make my point and do it well in 700 words?" Well, here are your six stages, hopefully, to success. Um, step number one is the most important thing. You need to have a powerful lead paragraph in your op-ed. We um, the the easiest way to do that um, I think is uh, with the timely anecdote that grabs attention. Um, again, going back to your particular niche and entry point into the kinds of issues that you possibly want to write op eds about are probably going to be personal. They, and those are probably going to be the most powerful things. Remember that you know that our stories are the the ones that need to get out there, and they're the ones that people will connect with. Um, so if you uh, if you can think of, for example, if you wanted to write an op ed inspired by your summit experience. Um, um, focusing in on one moment that really meant something to you or one thing that a speaker said and using that as your jumping off point or um, uh, or one moment in in you know where where were you when you um, for example when you heard today that Morsi was was uh, thrown out or uh, where were you when 9/11 happened or where were you when the Boston Marathon attack happened uh, starting in a timely way but finding an anecdote that connects to it um, is generally a, a good and easy way to start. That anecdote, you don't want to let it spread in that intro. You don't want to let it spread to more than um, the first two paragraphs or so. And I should mention that when we're talking about op-eds, your paragraphs are a lot shorter than your, you know, your your academic paper kinds of paragraphs. Paragraphs in newspaper op-ed language are generally a sentence or two, three max, um, and those have have got to be short sentences because it's got to be readable and short chunks of information. So. Ingredient number one is that timely anecdote that grabs or some f some fact that's going to grab attention, but you've got to be bold and direct and right up front. Um, the second ingredient that comes probably, let's say, two, three paragraphs in is your thesis. What is your main point? If I start out, and we'll, we'll look at an example in a second, if I start out by telling a story about my, you know, about my family and my growing up and what we, what we used to do on the 4th of July, uh, what is the point that I'm making? Well, you know, uh, let's say it's uh, American Muslims are as diverse as America itself and value, you know, our contribution since the, the beginning of, since the, even before the days of the United States of America um, or something along those lines. I would need to get to my central thesis, my main point within those first few paragraphs um, because that's when somebody will decide if they're going to keep reading or drop you at that point. Um, now, the next uh, two points don't necessarily have to be in this order. Um, uh, but number three is staking out your expert territory. We talked about this a little bit earlier, um, but the idea here is you have to you have to somehow make the case for why you are the expert. Again, whether it's your personal experience or it's an issue that you studied or you worked somewhere where this you know where this was relevant. Or you know whatever whatever the case may be, or you've you know I don't know read 50 books on the subject and you know every blog that's out there, um, you have to sort of make your point and draw that connection within the the text of the um, of the op-ed, or at least make it clear somehow. Um, and then number four is sometimes counterintuitive, which is to address the counter arguments. The best op-eds are the ones that say. I know what my opponents are going to say without saying it that way. Um, they're going to say there are you know things like there are those who would argue that um, you know uh, we need bo uh, full body scanners at airports in order to to protect us from terrorists. Um, you know, but uh, the the truth is that you know uh, Richard Reed and all the you know Richard Padilla, I mean Steve, Padilla, no, what's his name, Padilla, um, and other uh, terrorist suspects made it through. You know, without without body scanners or or whatever your argument's going to be. But addressing your counter argument uh, makes you appear even more well informed and unthreatened by um, by the counter argument essentially. Um, uh, okay, so that's number four. Number five, as you think about sort of how to wrap it back up, the 
uh, best thing to do is circle back to your thesis. Um, Op-eds that come full circle make them the sort of nicest conclusions um, in the sense that they either come back to the anecdote that it started with or um, uh, connect back to what the main thesis is and sort of chart the path forward. They answer number six, which is what's next. Um, what do you want to see happen next or what, can, what are you forecasting or whatever the case may be. Um, now again, these are these are six basic ingredients, and um, there there there's a whole. There should be an extra. I should do this. There should be an extra space between because this is where the bulk of your argument is going to be. There are probably three or four paragraphs in the middle there that will be you explaining you know your argument. Um, so I hope that that makes that makes sense as a basic outline. Now what I want to do is unshare that, and here we go. Is it removing? There we go. Okay, so now we've switched back. Um, I want to now flip to a couple of examples. I've given you what makes a good op-ed, what makes a bad op-ed, and also a basic recipe for um, for a good op-ed. And we'll, we'll send out these notes um, uh, afterwards or post them on the on the Google Plus page um, in addition to some other resources. Um, so now let's look at how this actually works in a few examples. Um, I want to first turn to an op-ed that was published by um, two op-eds actually uh, that were published by different young leaders um, alums um, and I'm gonna do a screen share and I know Sharif you have the links to what I'm about to share so you can also pop those links into the um, into the chat box um, but let's do the screen share again here we go and thank you for your patience. All right, start screen share. Okay, now let's see if I can zoom in so you can see it better. Is that any better or any worse? Okay, perhaps that, I hope that's uh, readable, but I'll read you the first paragraph. So this was an op-ed that was written by um, a delegate went to our first national DC summit back in 2007. Her name is Ayman John Muhammad, and she was a, a Texan. I know we've got some Texans on the line. Um, so this, she had this published in the Austin American Statesman, and the title was, For Muslim Americans, Faith Infuses Activism and Politics. And uh, the way that she started out her op-ed is this way. I recently found myself standing between Sharik Zafar, senior policy advisor in the Office of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, and Saqib Ali, Democratic delegate from Maryland's District 39, casually contributing to a conversation on issues of identity facing Muslim Americans entering politics. Bam. All right, so that's her first paragraph. Um, it, uh, she puts herself immediately on the scene and starts with an anecdote and uh, sort of, you know, by, by saying that she was casually contributing to a conversation on issues with these important people, she sort of sets the stage about, um, uh, about where she was. And then she jumps right into, it was the very essence of what we call civic engagement. Government officials who find their Muslim identity an asset were advising young uh, Muslim Americans to become engaged and effective political activists. After all, that's what democracy is all about, right? Um, and then she goes on, um, uh, it, you know, and you can read more in the link. Um, this op-ed uh, was able to be published in the Austin American Statesman because she's from that area. She had a local angle. Um, it was this was in early August, and uh, the, it was within a week after the summit had finished. So there was a timely angle to her trip to D.C. Um, and they were into publishing the voices of local, particularly young people, because those kinds of voices don't get um, don't get uh, published as often. So. Um, this was one op-ed that we had published, and so that gives you an example of how she went about it. Let me switch over now to another op-ed that was written by Nabil El Sharafa, who attended our 2008 uh, DC national or national summit, um, and this was called "Closing the Muslim Divide." And the subhead is: An American Muslim goes to Washington, speaks up, and opens his eyes. So you can probably tell even from that subhead that he sort of did the. Oh shoot, I forgot the Jimmy Carter reference, not Jimmy Carter, see here we go, Jimmy Stewart reference, the Mr. Smith goes to Washington I believe, um, which is, you know, that here's this local guy who went to Washington and had this experience, so he was from the area, this is the Santa Barbara News Press. Um, and you'll notice, think uh, how he started, how he starts his op-ed, which is this. When the fires broke out near my home in recent weeks, there was almost nothing that could keep me from my family and friends, my friends and family. But the promise of meeting with members of Congress who wanted to hear what young Muslims had to say 
was enough to pull me away. So he, with his opening uh, anecdote, he jumped right into, um, he used a local timely angle, which was that there were terrible fires that were going on in the Santa Barbara area. <clears throat> And he pegged it right to that. This um, connects him to other readers who can imagine, you know, the difficulty of that decision. This gives him an opportunity to connect with his readers and say, I'm local just like you. And, uh, and then to tell them why it was so important to him um, that he go away during this critical time. Um, so that's a pretty good, pretty good lead paragraph that can catch some attention. Um, and then he jumps into telling his story about um, what he was expecting and what he actually got from, uh, from the summit experience. Um, and he, yeah, I'll let you read the rest of it. But he, it's sort of his uh, uh, expected, perspective expanding story, right? So here's how, here's how, here's what I thought before and here's what I thought after and here's how I was changed. Um, and hopefully here's how that benefits me coming back to this local area. Um, so that's a second op-ed example. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm going to take a water break real quick. Okay, um, here we go. So this is the third one I wanted to show you. This is an op-ed, not by a Young Leaders alum, but um, this is an op-ed that Salam al our president, who I think most, most of you met, um, had published right after the uh, Boston Marathon attack. This was published on April 23rd, so that was about a week after um, the attack. And uh, this was called Islam Dragged Through the Mud by Extremists Like Sarnayev Brothers. Um, and this was published on the, Was in, on the Washington Post page and um, uh, also on their website, or on their newspaper, I mean. So let's just look quickly at Salem's opening paragraph. Uh, when I first heard about the Boston Marathon bombing, I was in shock and in disbelief. I was sick to my stomach reading the news of this tragedy, how families lost loved ones and innocent spectators lost limbs. I then called the FBI with the counterterrorism chief, call, called the FBI to speak with the counterterrorism chief and asked him if there was any information we could share with our community leaders in Boston and what they should do if they had seen anything suspicious leading up to the bombing. So Salem puts himself... Um, Right, uh, right in that day, and offers you know an inside look into what was happening for him, um, uh, and, and and connecting to the tragedy that we all felt um, first and foremost, um, and then talking about in this this op-ed. Um, then let's scroll down to where we find basically the thesis. The second paragraph says, and finally I asked him if there was anything I could do to help. Like all Americans, I did not know the background of the culprits and it did not matter. I offered my assistance as my civic duty to the country, no matter what others may think. That Monday I scrolled down my Facebook page and read prayers from Muslims hoping the perpetrator did not share our faith. It struck me as such a shame that the culprit's pot potential religious affiliation was on the minds of so many. Unfortunately, our obsession with labeling people distances us from the important mission, helping the victims of the terrorist attack and showing solidarity with the people of Boston. He goes on to talk about how terrorism has no faith and, uh, and what, what all of this means. But you can see through the lead up, hopefully that gives you a sense of how these things can work. Now finally, and I'm scrolling back just to make sure if there are any questions. I don't see any questions, which I'm shocked about. Um, feel free to, uh, to jump in at any time. I'll show you just a couple more examples. Um, I looked at the New York Times page today to see if there's anything there that sort of caught my eye. And this is one that, um, that did. Um, this is an op-ed um, that is about the NSA surveillance. But, and it's focused, it's, it says, data mining without Big Brother. So basically, these are two people who are arguing, who used to work for um, uh, for the government. Juan Zarate is somebody that we worked with when he worked under um, uh, President Bush. Um, yeah, and Leonard Schrank was the chief executive of SWIFT. Yeah, Juan Zarate was a former assistant treasury secretary. Um, so they talk about uh, what the alternative is to this kind of NSA surveillance and not having to go big brother. And so you can see how that kind of scopes out um, new territory within an existing issue. It's sort of offering a new alternative or, or a perspective that hasn't been um, looked at as carefully. Um, and this is another way where if you're not starting with an anecdote, just think about this kind of intro, which is, in the wake of revelations about the National Security Agency's surveillance programs, President Obama has acknowledged the imperative to balance privacy and security. 
but so far his administration's defense of the programs has failed to assure the public that this balance has been achieved or that basic privacy rights and civil liberties are being protected. They basically put their thesis right up front, like the, this is what's happening, um, and he, you know, and here's what uh, what you need to know about it. Lastly, um, one of my favorite op-ed writers and one of my favorite people on air is Fareed Zakaria. Um, I think that he he's one of the smartest writers around. Um, even when I disagree with him, I, uh, I I still usually think, huh, I didn't think about it that way. Um, so Fareed Zakaria, uh, this is what he published today after Morsi was ousted, um, and it's called Egypt's Lost Opportunity, and he is immediately jumping into an analysis of sort of what went wrong. Um, and he starts with an anecdote of sorts, which is, over the past three decades when American officials would gently press Egypt's Hosni Mubarak to stop jailing his opponents and initiate more democratic reforms, he would invariably snap back, do you want the Muslim Brotherhood in power? Wednesday's events suggest that Egyptians continue to face this choice between military dictatorship and an illiberal democracy. To succeed, the new leadership in Egypt has to find a way to reject both. That's a task for Egyptians, not for the United States. So you can see how right in that paragraph there is, um, it packs a punch, right? It grabs your attention, um, it connects you to the issue, and it tells you exactly what his, uh, what his thesis is. Um, all right, I'm going to switch back now. Um, if anything, I want to just, hi everybody, I want to just show you again very quickly, um, oops, here we go, I want to show you again very quickly that um, basic op-ed outline, because um, this is generally what, if we had continued to read into those uh, various examples we went through, um, you would see that the, uh, they, they mostly hit that, um, these different uh, pieces of what makes a, a good op-ed. Um, so, having said all of that, um, I want to take a good, good long pause here, and um, what I'd like for you to hopefully participate in at this point, um, since I'm not seeing any questions, is given that this is this is sort of your framework for good op-eds, bad op-eds, what may you know the structure of an op-ed, and then we sort of now looked at um, some examples. Um, uh, Having done all of that, you've got your sort of 101 covered. Um, I want to now think about, okay, if you, the, the seven or eight or more of you who are on, the, on this Google Plus right now, um, are going to write an op-ed in the next week or two weeks, um, what are the issues that you would write about that are timely, um, that you have a unique opinion on or a unique perspective on? Um, and of course, are, can any of those uh, connect back or trace back uh, to your ex uh, experience at the summit in any way would just be the cherry on top, I can't help but say. Um, so if you can, um, if you've been thinking about, okay, if I were to write an op-ed, here's what I would want to write about, can you put those things into the chat box now and Sharif will share them with me? Um, because what we could do, if people do offer a few ideas, is think about what the, what the potential angles could be. Right now, I would say, um, just thinking off, uh, thinking about this today and speaking with Mariam, our communications coordinator, if you haven't met her, um, some of the things that are on our radar this week in terms of timely angles, um, of course now there is what's going on in Egypt and uh, the intersection between that and the 4th of July uh, is, uh, is a pretty interesting intersection that could be explored. Um, there is also Ramadan coming next week, um, and you know, uh, as we were talking about in our meeting this week, um, of course you can always focus on the hardship, and that certainly, you know, hardship makes a good peg sometimes. But to um, to reflect uh, on the bigger cause, on the bigger point, um, and the principles that are involved, uh, there is more interest in publishing those kinds of stories of faith or um, firsthand perspectives during Ramadan than um, any other time. If any of you are doing any Anything interesting or let's say untraditional for Ramadan. I mean, I'm sure most of you have heard about the 30 mosques in 30 days uh, national tour. Um, uh, we've had, uh, I've heard of groups and we've been participated in groups in the past where they've done, um, like our young leaders did a stories at sunset uh, daily blog during Ramadan, um, or people do um, humanitarian day during Ramadan, or any other kinds of community service or other things that are going on. Those also make for good anecdotes and 
some good pegs to um, unique Ramadan stories because media are always, reporters and producers are always looking for unique um, Ramadan stories instead of the usual, like, oh, the athletes that, you know, how do they do it all day long. Um, other topics, uh, there's obviously what's going on continuously in Syria. Um, or, you know, you fill in the country. Um, there's also domestic issues like the NSA surveillance, what that means to you as a young American Muslim. Um, uh, and, you know, that that's an important um, subject. Um, uh, also things like the ongoing questions around extremism are certainly um, timely in an ongoing way, whether we like it or not. Um, and there's a host of other things. Um, we, oh, um, Sharif is reminding me to tell you to post your questions on the event page. So I don't know if you're, if you're posting somewhere else, but what you want to do is go to the Google Plus. I'll do, do it also so I make sure to direct you, right? Um, go to the Google Plus page that, uh, where you logged in, and there's a chat box where it says, it shows your picture kind of in the top left or middle left, and then it says say something next to that. So if you enter your um, comments there, then I will see them. Here we go. Denna. Thank you, Denna. Um, did I switch back over here? Let's switch back from the screen share so you don't have to stare at that list. Okay, I'm back. Um, I see yours. Yes, Dana says going back to school is another topic. Getting ready for another school year. Yeah, for sure. And the the key with that is um, is when you pitch that kind of op ed, and that would be uh, focusing around let's say August generally. You know, early to mid August, um, particularly, and you know, depending on when your school starts is even more important because that comes um, comes well there, and that people are always looking for back to back to school angles. Um, the question is how. <clears throat> Is what angle you would uh, you would take with the back to school topic? Um, it might be interesting for you to take on issues like um, student loans or tuition hikes or let's you know let's let's say angles that are not expected for the average Muslim student um, to be taking on. Um, and I know, for example, here there was just well, it's not an op-ed reference, but um, uh, the student regent for the UC system is um, a hijabi college student from one of the one of the UCs. So that's it. That would be an interesting angle on education. And Dena, I'm sure you can develop uh, equally interesting um, angles on education, even based on your own experiences working with um, underprivileged uh, youth um, and their own experiences with getting getting ready to go back to school. Um, so that's a good one. Um, Jawad just posted. Um, I'd had an idea to deal with the 4th of July from the perspective of young Muslim Americans, mainly how they celebrate it no different than other groups. Um, yeah, I think that that would be cool. And the thing, uh, Jawad, is that you got to act fast because guess what? It's the 3rd of July. So um, in terms of the major newspapers, most of them, actually practically all of them, have already slotted out their um, op-eds for tomorrow. Um, but that doesn't mean that your window is over because if you can write something quickly, even like a blog piece, um, there are other, you know, there's Muslim media outlets. Um, there are um, uh, places like the Huffington Post. Um, uh, I'm drawing a blank. There are more, more places than that. But um, but I think that that would uh, that would be great. Um, and then thinking about um, uh, you just need to add in your again some sort of personal angle to make it um, to make it pop from other people's uh, submissions about the same kind of subject. Um, like we're all the same as a good theme, but you have to get there by first going through some sort of conflict. So that makes it interesting to people. You know that you're you're a film person. It needs it needs a little drama. Um, Dana posted, I'm hoping to write an op-ed about young Muslim leaders who work on campus and experience leadership positions um, or contributed to campus activities. Yeah, I think that would be awesome. Um, your first-hand experiences are going to go a long way. A great place to start publishing is in your campus newspaper. Um, uh, your campus newspaper will also potentially have slots for regular uh, columnists and regular um, op-ed writers, um, and that's a great, great opportunity to s start developing your voice and uh, and adding to the you know to the campus conversation about stuff that you care about. Um, so uh, look into those opportunities, and then there's always um, I didn't haven't talked about sort of mediums or how you actually pitch an op-ed, and the reason I I've shortchanged that is um, uh, Miriam and I uh, are here to help you 
um, pitch your op-eds and hopefully get them published. Uh, we hope that you'll take ownership of uh, writing an op-ed, draft something, send it to us. Um, we should be able to give you feedback, if not within 24 hours, maximum 48 hours, depending on the day we're, days we're having, um, and, uh, and help you finalize it so that we can then help you pitch it. Um, the main thing with pitching is, if you're going to do it yourself, is to go to the opinion page of, um, oh good, you just asked that question. Can you elaborate a bit on the process of submitting an op-ed? Okay, good. So um, if, you're gonna, if you're going to submit it on your own, the main thing to do is kind of uh, is to go to the opinion page of the of the place that you want to um, uh, where place you wanted to get it published. So if it's the LA Times, you're going to go to LATimes.com and you're going to click on opinion, and they'll generally have guidelines for submissions, um, and it'll tell you where to what the email address is to. Uh, um, to submit it at. Um, my suggestion is in the subject line when you send it to that person is to say op-ed you know or op-ed submission colon um, or op-ed on and you know put some sort of topic that uh, will grab their attention. Um, sometimes they will, sometimes they won't take your your headline suggestions. I, I should tell you that and also you should also know, I'm sorry I'm backtracking, but you should also know that if they do accept your op-ed they still uh, uh, retain the right to help edit it for to smooth it out or make it fit within their word count or things along those lines, but that will be a collaborative process and you sign off on things. So don't be um, thrown off by um, editing. Everybody gets edited. Um, that's, that's part of being, part of doing any kind of writing. Um, so you want to send that email, the subject line basic, um, and a, a short note at the top that says basically dear, and hopefully you can personalize it to whoever the editor is if you can find their name, um, and that's what Mariam and I do also, is, uh, is then to say, you know, uh, uh, I, I've, below is a uh, op-ed I, I would like to submit on the following subject, and you want to do like the quick kernel of what makes your op-ed interesting so it makes them want to keep reading, and uh, you know, like uh, I, I offer you this um, on an exclusive basis. Most media outlets want ex uh, the exclusive right for publishing. Like they want exclusivity. They want the, to be the only ones where you're publishing it. If you and that makes it difficult to sign a kind of um, submit uh, to more than one publication at a time because uh, most of them like exclusivity. So we can get into those details with you. Um, but that's the basic thing. And then you want to uh, copy paste the the op-ed text into the email, uh, which is better than sending the attachment the first time around because um, uh, attachments trigger all kinds of uh, spam box uh, reactions um, and uh, it's better to just put it in the op-ed. It also is good to put at the top the number of words. So you put your, your, your suggested title, you put by your name, and you put word count and you find the word count, you put it right there and then your op-ed and then at the end of it you do one to two sentences about who you are basically. That's your byline, that's what they call it. Um, so that's how you submit it. They'll usually let you know within uh, a day or two um, and uh, you should get some sort of email response saying, you know, no thank you um, or yes we're interested and we'd like to talk to you about this or that. Um, and that's basically how the submission process goes. So I, I hope I hope that helps. And again, Mariam and I you know, are are here to to help you work on that part of it. Um, and I, uh, Sharif and and Sada, if you're able to, if you're on, if you could um, start sharing the links to the past MPAC op-eds that I had emailed you, um, then there we go. Then. Um, uh, yeah, then you can see some places where MPAC has had op-eds published, whether it's the Washington Post or the Christian Science Monitor, CNN, uh, LA Times, um, San Diego Union Tribune, a bunch of different places. So um, I'm looking again to see if there's any additional questions. I think I've I've uh, I've talked myself out, <laughs> um, and I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Please, again, jump in right now if you have any additional questions. Um, uh, what I will do at this point, while I'm seeing if there's anything else, <clears throat> is I will send you um, or we'll post on this page somehow or, uh, a couple of handouts on writing an op-ed and a little bit more um, explanation on that basic outline that I shared with you that um, uh, provides a little more meat to each subject. Um, and I will also, yeah, we will try to keep sending you more samples. Um, now, the last thing I want to say is um, uh, in order to be a writer, you must write. 
Um, I tell myself this all the time. You, even though I'm giving you the um, op-ed uh, training and I'm staring into this camera and doing that, um, I have not published an op-ed in many, many years. I've had one published over all the years um, and have done a lot more on the editing side than I have um, on uh, on uh, yeah, rather than in my own name. Sarah asks, so if we got rejected, can we send it to other publishers? The answer is yes, absolutely. Um, and yeah, and so you just you know that the best thing to do is usually have a plan A, plan B, plan C, so you sort of, you're ready to move on to the next person once you, you hear from one. Um, that's a great question. Um, I mentioned that because um, writing is intimidating and every, a lot of people get intimidated by, it, intimidated by it, but the best way to write is to, to be a writer is to write. Um, and uh, that's why uh, every person needs a good editor and hopefully we can help you with that and uh, I'm sure there are others in your life who will offer you great feedback if you ask them to look at an op-ed draft. Um, so I hope that you guys will seize this opportunity <coughs> excuse me, seize this opportunity and write your first op-ed or for some of you uh, your next op-ed um, about um, a subject that, is, that you're passionate about and that you would like to speak about. Um, we are here and ready to offer support um, and help you, help, help you get published inshallah. Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out directly either to Mariam or myself. And as you probably know, our email addresses are just our first names at impact.org. So Mariam and Adina at impact.org. Um, thank you all for making the time to be here. I'm proud that we got this uh, done in 45 minutes or less. Um, I am bummed that I was not able to see all your wonderful faces, but uh, I do hope that we get the chance to uh, at least talk by phone, if not have some some one-on-one -on -one time uh, soon with many of you. Um, thank you all for being here, and we'll sign out now the way that we always do. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's with the Surah Al-Asr. Bismillah ar-Rahim al-Asr in an-Sana li fi khusr illa dina amanu wa amanu salihati wa tuwasu bil haqi wa tuwasu bil sabr. Surely by the flight of time, man is in a state of loss, except for those who believe and those who do good deeds, and those who, those who <coughs> excuse me, demonstrate wisdom and those who practice patience. Um, I hope to talk to you all very, very soon. Take care. Assalamu alaikum. Hmm.